plays uh, where I try to pre present a provocative issue and encourage discussion afterwards. Uh, this is totally different. This is the only play I've ever done where all the facts are true, uh, the flourishes are mine, uh, but this is an advocacy thing. And you'll see from uh, the presentation that uh, I was trying to uh, convince the court to do something. Uh, just let me tell you how it got started. I received a telephone call Where's Olivia? Right here. <laughs> from Olivia Hodges uh, in Colorado asking me if I would do an interview about um, an issue that had arisen in the trial in which everybody here was involved. And uh, it was a very minor thing. Uh, it was a no-brainer for me whether or not uh, the court could affirm a conviction uh, without parts of the transcript. And we spoke, and then I became very interested in the case. I looked it up. Uh, I began writing uh, articles slowly for the Huffington Post because I didn't want to offend my colleagues on the court, but I got angrier and angrier uh, as they went on and eventually decided to uh, write a play about it, and uh, we're, we'll show it uh, in a few minutes. And Martin Lawrence is here, one of the actors. Martin, Martin stand up and let everybody know who you are. Martin. Martin. And the reason Martin is so important is that after we did the play, the actors all felt so strongly about it that they decided they'd like to make a video of it in the hopes and put it on YouTube in the hopes that we can get people to sign a clemency for this petition. And I'll, I'll tell you about that. But um, now our plan is to show the video. It's not that long, it's about 40 minutes. And uh, you'll get a sense of what happened. And then afterwards, I'm going to ask I don't want to say defendants anymore. <laughs> I'll say speakers uh, will be up here to answer any of your questions. And I think and I hope uh, you'll find it very interesting and, and very informative. So with that, uh, Micah, roll them. <laughs> 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 I'm David Ellenstein. I'm the artistic director of the North Coast Repertory Theater in Solana Beach, California. A couple of months back, we did a reading of a short play by the retired judge, the Honorable H. Lee Sarakin, who served on the United States District Court as well as the Court of Appeals. He wrote a play called The Race Card Face Up which exposes an injustice that has occurred in our judicial system. The theater has donated our resources and our time, and the actors have donated their skills so that we could make a recording of this play for you to see. At the end of the play, there'll be a link to a clemency petition that we're hoping to get before President Obama. If you are so moved, we hope that you will sign that petition. And now, the race card, face up. This is TV station WCOL bringing you an interview from the Federal Correction Prison in Florence, Colorado with five of the six defendants known as the IRP-6. You will also be hearing from a family member at a remote location. The warden has kindly given the prisoners the right to wear street clothes for this interview which the families have provided. You will first hear from Mr. David Banks and then the others in turn. Mr. Banks. My name is David Banks, and I'm serving an 11-year sentence at the Federal Correctional Complex Prison Camp in Florence, Colorado. I've lost everything. My business, my money, my family, my future, my church, and my freedom. And 
everything but my faith. Nothing in my life would have predicted me being labeled a criminal and a convict. I guess I'm what you'd call a army brat. My dad was in the U.S. Army for more than 20 years. He loved and respected it. And so did I. He served two tours in Vietnam, volunteering for his second tour. My mother is a pastor who taught me Christian values. I went to the University of Colorado, but left before I graduated and enlisted in the Navy. I was assigned to the Naval Air Control School, being one of two students who scored 100% on the entrance exam. I graduated the top of my class. I ultimately was stationed at the Willow Grove, Pennsylvania Naval Air Station. After about three years, my father died, so I left the Navy and came home to take care of my mother. I had friends working in the information technology, and I decided to pursue a career in that field, where I spent the next 14 years working as a software consultant, doing work for MCI, AT&T, Verizon, WorldCom, IBM, and the Supreme Court of Nevada. I then decided to work with my brother-in-law, Gary Walker, on a very exciting project, and through no fault of his, that's where the nightmare began. My name is Gary Walker, and I'm serving a sentence of 11 years in the same prison. Just like David, service to our country was in our history and in our blood. My father was in the Air Force, and I dreamed of being a fighter pilot from about the time I was nine. President Ronald Reagan granted me an appointment to the United States Air Force Academy. I couldn't make it as a pilot though because of my poor eyesight. So I completed my education at the University of Colorado obtaining a degree in computer science. After college, I worked on what was known as the Star Wars Project at Martin Marietta. I was assigned to the National Test Facility at Falcon Air Force Base in Colorado I have designed and developed key software components to the Star Wars program, created to defend against nuclear attack. I personally met and demonstrated the program to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and French Prime Minister Pierre Schumann, hardly the precursor of a life crime. Just an aside, not only were the six of us all devout members of the same church, there was not a single criminal charge or conviction among any of us until these unbelievable events unfolded. I went on to spend my time after Marietta, now Lockheed, as a senior software consultant for numerous Fortune 500 companies. My name is Clinton Stewart, and I'm serving a sentence of 10 years at the same prison in Colorado. It's fitting that we lived, prayed, and worked together that we should end up dying together, because that is what prison is for us and our families. I don't think future criminals suited me either. I was brought up in a very hardworking and very religious family. I joined the Air Force after a year of college. After seven years of service, I was selected for a special agent assignment overseas while serving as a crypto systems engineer at NORAD Space.com. Unfortunately, I had to decline because my father fell ill. I requested a hardship separation and was honorably discharged. I love the Air Force and my work there. Once back in the States, I had an excellent and active career as a cybersecurity expert, technologist, and consultant before joining this group. I am Kendrick Barnes, and I am serving a seven-year sentence at the same prison in Colorado. I was the Chief Information Officer at IRP Solutions, the name of our company. I had 15 years prior experience in information systems management, software development, systems integration, and architecture. I've done work for companies such as Syndag, Merkel, Western Union, and Comcast Communications. My father, too, was a retired vet and spent 22 years in the United States Army with two tours in Vietnam. I was also a member of the same church for 30 years, as were and are my friends and business partners. Also, please permit me to brag about my wife, Tisha Barnes. She is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, class of 2004. She served as a cadet squadron commander in her senior year. 
She is part of a long military tradition. Her father was a decorated war veteran, an army ranger. Her grandfather was a Vietnam veteran and a Green Beret. Her mother is a retired colonel in the United States Medical Service Corps and served in the Pentagon and the office of the Surgeon General. I am Demetrius Harper, and I'm serving a 10-year sentence at the same prison. Likewise, I have 15 years experience in information technology. I attended the University of Colorado from 1993 to 1998. I worked for companies including Oracle, Compaq, and MCI WorldCom. I joined IRP because I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to launch a new and successful product and at the same time aid law enforcement and protect the country. I attended the same church for 30 years and served as a minister there as well. My father also served in the U.S. Army. At the age of 20, he served in South Korea. He was an instructor at Fort Lewis and served an extended tour in Vietnam. Every school he attended while in service, he graduated in the top 1%. After only 17 years of service, he was selected for the Sergeant Majors Academy, something I understand is unprecedented by Army standards. Four of my uncles also served in the armed forces. So let me describe what it is uh, we were trying to develop and sell. It was highly complex, but I'll, I'll try to simplify it. One of the great failings that led to the catastrophe of 9-11 was the failure of various government and law enforcement agencies to share information. There were numerous articles written about the failure and the need to develop a system that would to help coordinate essential information among all law enforcement agencies. So I decided I would try and develop a software solution that would revolutionize the way law enforcement agencies collaborated and shared information. I eventually labeled it Investigative Resource Plan, IRP. After years of development work, we demonstrated it to anyone who might be interested, including members of Congress, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and several police departments, including New York and Philadelphia. The interest was great, but each had suggestions to comply with their own needs. In order to satisfy those requests and uh, requirements, we needed more programming. We contracted with staffing companies, a very common practice, to provide the expertise we needed. Everyone we dealt with knew of our financial circumstances. We were a new company and a new venture. We were optimistic about our projects and, and relayed that enthusiasm to the staffing company. But please understand this. The staffing companies hired and paid the employees. We didn't get the money, except some hourly payments for work we actually performed. The only way we could ever make money is if the program were completed and a success. I can say without hesitation that we intended to pay every staffing company with whom we contracted. We believed there were multi-million dollar contracts out there available to us. There was never a moment when we engaged a staffing company without expecting to pay them eventually and in full. We never denied owing the money or that, uh, that we were late or, or, or slow in paying. Everything was taking much longer than we expected. But we never intended to cheat anyone. Our own crime was optimism. And that optimism was based on the interest and promises we received from prospective customers. So you may well be asking, how did we all end up in prison? It all started with a letter dated March 8, 2004, from a former U.S. attorney to the current U.S. attorney. He said we were guilty of fraud and outlined what he claimed it was. We, of course, didn't see the letter at that time, but we have seen it since. What we found strange was not only this charge of criminal activity out of the blue, but the fact that nowhere in the letter does he say whom he represented. To this day, we don't know whether it was a claimant or a competitor. Somebody asking, who are these small-time, uppity black guys playing with the big boys for these huge contracts? But that was just the beginning for us. 
What came next was in the form of a surprise FBI raid on our business on February 9, 2005. It is difficult for me to describe that day for you without being emotional. 21 agents stormed through our offices, rummaged through our files, took our intellectual property, and seized our records. They confined us in a lunchroom while they took our life's work from us, and eventually, our lives. But strangely, months later, after the FBI literally has everything about our business, apparently some staffing company requested that the FBI conduct a criminal investigation. And what did the same FBI office conclude as we all contended, rightfully so, that this was a civil matter, and they declined to proceed further. The letter dated August 8, 2005 says, we regret to inform you that we are unable to assist you in this matter, and therefore no investigation will be conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We feel this case would best be handled civilly. Signed, Richard C. Powers, Special Agent in Charge, Denver. Despite the FBI's conclusion that this was a civil matter, someone unbeknownst to us was pushing it hard and the charges were submitted to a grand jury in March of 2007, some two years after that first accusatory letter. The grand jury undoubtedly arriving at the same conclusion that this was simply a debt collection matter refused to indict. Something we are advised is a rarity in the world of criminal justice. And this was despite the fact that starting in December of 2006, the FBI began targeting members of our church at their homes and jobs. And many of them were called before the grand jury to testify. Everything was being done to bring us down. And then in June of 2009, four years later, they finally got a grand jury to indict us. This time, they only called one witness, an FBI agent. And the old adage that a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich was proven. <laughs> Afterwards, in order to dissuade the prosecution, we submitted a complete proffer, detailing everything we had done, said, written, or possessed that had any relationship to the charges. If they paid any attention, it completely exonerated us. But it fell on deaf ears and blind eyes. They were out to get us, and there was no convincing otherwise. So you must be asking why. Why are you all in prison serving terms from seven to 11 years? The answer is, we failed to pay our course of bills. That's really our crime. One thing we never denied, we owed the money. We had every intention of paying it. But the only way we could do so is if the business were a success. Everybody we dealt with knew that. We were a lousy credit risk unless we became successful, and we thought we were on the brink. We had a commitment from the Colorado Bureau of Investigations for $375,000. Unfortunately, they reneged. But we did have a $12 million verbal agreement for a pilot project with the Department of Homeland Security. And a couple of months before the FBI raided our business, they asked and received a quote for two software modules that exceeded $100 million. Additionally, we had the promise of a multi-million dollar deal with the New York City Police Department. But the indictment, the leaks that preceded it, the FBI raid, the seizure of our work, our files, our software, ended all of that when word leaked out that we were raided and under criminal investigation. So in essence, it was the government which prevented us from honoring our obligations. Obligations we always intended to honor. I won't bore you with all the details of the case. Essentially, the government argued that we were a sham, we were con merchants, that there was no viable computer program and that we lied to the staffing companies about our prospects in order to get them to pay programmers to work for us. Can we ask you some questions? If you were gonna run a scam, do you single out only law enforcement agencies as your pigeons? <laughs> if you're going to cheat people and sell them some snake oil, 
Do you start with the police, the FBI, Homeland Security? And do you work for years on a project with friends and family, spending all of your time and your money, borrowing small amounts from friends and family and fellow church members? Do you personally guarantee the debts to the staffing companies if you never intended to pay them? Would you hire two retired FBI agents and a former immigration customs official to work inside as independent contractors to help develop and improve the system? Would you hire and pay two major law firms to represent you? Would you take the time and incur the expense to travel to law enforcement agencies all over the country to demonstrate your program? And would you lease space of, of 10,000 square feet for $20,000 per month, decorate it, and invite law enforcement representatives to an opening? Would you seek investment capital, lines of credit, and create an investment prospectus? And explain to me, how do you make money having staffing companies pay the employees directly? Even the government had to concede we made no money on this alleged scheme. Here's a quote from the U.S. attorney in his opening statement to the jury. The evidence isn't going to show that the defendants got fabulously wealthy from this scheme. How true? The government did present evidence from the staffing companies that we claim we actually had contracts, something that we denied. But despite the government's claim that we built staffing companies, the truth is, out of the $5 million paid by staffing companies, we each averaged, for work we actually did, about $50,000 a year for two years. That's it. Some scam. That's a fraction of what we could have made working for other companies. 88% of the money paid out went to programmers and consultants, not us. The only way we could have made any money is if the program were a success and we had paying and satisfied customers and contracts. There was no way for us to make money otherwise. It's like saying we were constructing a building, hiring contractors who paid their employees to build something that we never intended to finish or sell. If it was a scam, we were the stupidest con man ever. We were certain that the prosecution could never convince the jury that we were criminals, or that the program was a fake, or that the staffing companies had been intentionally built. We were so convinced that we fired our court-appointed lawyers, all of whom wanted us to plead guilty to something we had not done. We decided to represent ourselves, having faith in the justice system. I know what you're thinking. We were stupid, but we were innocent. No one was going to convict us. We're afraid you won't hear us out if we recite everything that happened at the trial. So we want to tell you one incident that will give you a flavor of what we confronted. The government concluded its case earlier than predicted by offering evidence of the charges mentioned before. They brought up the fact that we used multiple corporations and some billing practices to make us look sinister. But the heart of the case was that we were a bogus company out to scam the staffing companies. As a result of their early finish, we were now ready with our defense, and we were scrambling for witnesses because the court had unexpectedly denied allowing our two expert witnesses to testify. The denial, supposedly based on our failure to properly notify the prosecution. Although both experts were on our witness list and both had furnished letters to the government outlining their opinions regarding the staffing practices. We asked for delays and the judge became very impatient with us. At one point she said to us that either we do a witness or one of us would have to take the stand or our case would be closed. Here was a threat from the court that could end our case. We could caucus and decided that one of us had to testify. I testified and then Gary objected. A dolly broke, broke out because Gary said our Fifth Amendment rights had been violated by compelling us to testify. 
The judge said she had not said anything of the kind, and we demanded the transcript. We were all absolutely unanimous in our verbatim version of what she had said. She denied production of the transcript for that day and at the time, some 200 pages, but assured us that they would be produced at the end of the day. Transcript? of that particular conversation in the courtroom between us and the judge has never been produced to this day. We were told it was missing. It was available, but they would not turn it over. That it had never been recorded by the reporter. That we could not see the original notes, etc. A million excuses, but never the transcript. We even started a civil suit against the reporter on the ground that we had paid for the entire transcript and had not received it. The suit was dismissed. Neither the court reporter nor the U.S. attorney ever filed an affidavit testifying as to what was said or what happened in the transcript of that conversation, and neither have denied our version. The silence speaks volumes. The judge has said she doesn't remember her exact words. Everybody concedes that she said something, including the judge who heard the civil matter seeking the transcript. He concluded that no record of the conversation existed. We have no doubt what it was. Of course, the testimony, the objection, and the subsequent refusal to continue testifying all took place in front of the jury. How do you think a jury reacts when one defendant testifies and another objects on the grounds of self-incrimination? Try when in that case. You have heard the sentences that we received. Seven to 11 years. Seven to 11 years. Did we kill anybody? Did we rape anybody? Did we assault or rob anyone? Aside from us and our families, the only ones that were hurt were the staffing companies. They were paid what we owed them, and we regret that. And there were many other companies involved. Some stopped doing business with us when they didn't get paid, so we had to find others. Forty in all, but we were confident of success and didn't want to give up. I know any story should have some humor. This is fun. But it is laughable. After we were sentenced, we were denied bail. We were flight risks. We had lived in the same place virtually all our lives. Our extended families and our families lived here. We had all belonged to the same church for the last 15 years. We had no money. We could barely afford a bus ticket to the next town. The government had taken everything that made it possible for our business to survive. But we were declared flight risks and sat in prison from the time of sentencing to the decision on appeal. The guilty verdicts were rendered on October 20th, 2011. And the decision from the Court of Appeals was not rendered until June 30th, 2014. The day we were all waiting for. Time to go home. My name is Kaya Banks, and I'm David Banks' daughter. I'm here to represent the wives, the sisters, the fathers, um, the brothers of these five men, and to tell you their stories. And trust me, if they were here right now, you'd be welcome. But we don't want sympathy. We want outrage. We want justice. My father was sentenced on July 27, 2012. And I was not allowed to go that day because two of his friends had been sentenced. They had been shackled and hauled away, and neither of my parents wanted me to see that. You believe it or not, I was accepted to college that very same day, and I called my mom at court to tell her the news, and she said at that very moment that they'd taken my father and hauled him away. And I can't describe all the ways that I miss him. I can't call him in prison. He has to call me, and then calls for women today. And multiply that sadness for six families. Prison. You hear about it. You read about it. But it's indescribable once you're actually there. 
Everything I own fits in a locker that is waist high. And my bed is about the size of a baby's crib. And it's either metal or, or a concrete slab. I'm told when to eat and who I live with, where I can go, what I can do and not do. My cellmates have not been charged with violent crimes. And yet they can be as frightening as a convicted serial axler. I've been strip searched so many times that I've developed immunity to it. Prison is a place where lost appeals and unrealized hopes cause us to lose the will to make it another day. While we are here, we all know that our families are likewise serving time. Neither us nor them for crimes committed. Here's a letter from Yolanda Walker. Here's one. I was in court when the verdict came down. It never occurred to any of us that it would be guilty. I just went up. I was in total shock. My brother David looked at me and now it was going to be okay, but it wasn't. I didn't know how I was going to tell my son and the other children. My hands were shaking so that I couldn't text the word guilty. Then they put shackles on their wrists, their feet, and around their waists and they were all shuffled out of the courtroom like some chain gang. That's when we all lost it. That was the worst day of my life, and I relive it every day. How could this have happened to my husband and these other sweet, hard-working friends? How could this have happened in America? Everything has been taken from me. It is now gone. So in my heart, I have to let everything go for the time being. Nothing here belongs to me. I can't provide anything for myself. But somehow, I still feel the need to live and make the best of a terrible situation. Here you are constantly surrounded by depressed resignation, which tries to steal your hope away. It's like a sickness that is contagious and you can catch it just by walking by other inmates. Thank God for my family and those friends of mine who always preached God. Because right now, that's all I have left. Daisy Bowden, Kendrick's mother, raised her son in the church and taught him how to respect his elders and the laws of the land. And every Sunday, she would cook this big meal for him and his wife, and then they would spend the whole day together. And now, she just spends every Sunday missing the key coming through the door. And just missing him. I find it ironic that there are signs all over this place with the words Department of Justice. We all should be in facilities that say Department of Injustice. I know that family values have taken a hit lately. Politicians who profess it but do not practice it. But faith remains. We were all brought up to be believers, to trust in God. I just celebrated one of my birthdays in here. It was just like any other day. I ate a little terrible food, slept not very well as usual, worked for 18 cents an hour, talked with friends, listened to the news, and prayed. I wore my same green shirt, green pants, black boots, no cake, no candles, no tie, or sweaters, no family, no singing happy birthday. But I know, we all know that we have family, friends, church members, and a whole community that cares about us. The fact that we're not abandoned or forgotten is what sustains us, keeps us sane in this crazy world. But we didn't give up hope. The total lack of any evidence of criminal intent, violating a criminal defendant's Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination, combined with the foul smell of the critical missing transcript, it would be hard to believe that any court would ever let this verdict stand. 
We had waited all this time for the appellate court decision. But it would all be worth it on the day we were set free. It was just a matter of time. Of being patient. Of believing in God and justice. On the way. They finally arrived. The Court of Appeal had decided. We were going home. Wrong. Convictions affirmed. Evidence supports convictions. Missing transcript irrelevant. The court said we had another witness, an FBI agent sitting and assisting the prosecutor throughout the case that was on our list and we could have called him. He was also listed to discuss the scope of a search warrant, hard in the heart of our defense, and certainly not one of the desirable lead off witnesses. So they moved, we didn't have to take the stand, even if the judge said what we said, she said. No harm, no foul. Game over. I cannot recite for you all of the false and misleading evidence that was marshaled against us at the trial, but let me give you one example that the appellate court relied upon in affirming our convictions. The government claimed that I used the alias Regal Howard in obtaining money from the staffing companies because my name was next to his in the parentheses in our records. The truth? Enrico Rico Howard worked for us as a software configurations manager specialist and was paid directly for his work. My name appeared next to him because he reported directly to me. But this was the type of evidence that was used to make us look sinister, convict us, and have the convictions affirmed. Have you ever felt betrayed? Have you ever had your faith in mankind and justice destroyed in a single moment? I can't list the way we all felt at that moment. We were patriots. We and our parents had served our country in the armed forces. This project was to help the country. Sure, we hope to make money, but the thought of protecting the country was just as important to us. We were religious. We were family men who loved and respected our parents, our spouses, our siblings, our children. We were black men who defied all odds, worked hard, got educations, never in trouble with the law, gained experience, and formed a company. And they whipped us, just like the old days. This is a letter from Sarah Harper, Demetrius's mother. We raised Demetrius in the church since he was the babe. His only sister died at the age of 13 from a terrible illness, so he's all we've got. He always worked hard, sometimes working two jobs to make a good life for his family. My heart aches every time we go to visit him at the sight of him in green prison khakis. The same for my husband, his father, who served in the Vietnam War. And there's such hopelessness in our son's eyes. And none of us can believe what has happened. That our funny, bright, outgoing, energetic son is in prison for a crime he did not commit. I think I should mention that we weren't totally abandoned. A group known as a just cause did everything humanly possible for us. We could not find any outside lawyers or innocent projects to represent us. But a very nice young African American lawyer, Gwendolyn Solomon, agreed to help us pro bono on the appeal and again volunteered the petition to the United States Supreme Court. Our hopes were diminishing. We knew it was going to be a long shot, but there was no other place to go. But there, on the very first day of the new Supreme Court term in October 2014, was our name and docket number under the long list of petitions. Denied. Braylon Harper, age nine, son of Demetrius, asked me to tell you this. When he was seven, his dad went to prison and he said, I'm really sad because I have to leave when I've got place. I wish my dad could come home. I miss him and I want to play with him, run with him, watch movies with him. I feel bad for my sister Kayla who can't play soccer anymore because my mom can't afford it. We maintain our faith 
despite everything. Do we think this happened because five of us are black? I don't know. But an FBI agent did ask me during a raid whether we would hire a qualified woman if she were white. We don't know who or why someone pushed so hard to see us indicted and convicted. But let me ask you this. Car companies have killed people. Rig explosions of oil companies have killed people, destroyed the environment and business. Cigarette companies have killed and harmed millions of people. Banks and brokerage companies have destroyed life savings and deprived people of their homes. How many of those executives were indicted, convicted, and sentenced to prison? How many white executives go to prison for 11 years for not paying corporate debt? Even if the jury believed that we lied to the staffing companies, how do we gain from that except to improve our program so that we could sell it and pay them? I don't want to play the race card. But will somebody explain to me why six guys, five black and one white, with no criminal record, no intent to defraud anyone with our backgrounds, get indicted, denied bail, pending appeal, convicted, and receive unbelievably harsh sentences, unless it has something to do with the color of our skin. Our lives, our families have been destroyed, basically because we owe them. Somehow, I don't feel this happens to white people. We don't suggest that the judges involved were biased against us because we were black. Maybe race had nothing to do with it, but, but if it played a role, it was deeply embedded into our case long before it got to them. I suppose you noticed that our white brother, David Zeropolo, who worked with us for years and, and was an indispensable part of our team, and was a fellow church member, isn't here for this interview. Why? Because his friends and family believe that he wouldn't be here in prison with us if he hadn't gone into business with five black brothers. And I suspect they may be right. I wish that I could be more articulate. I wish I could express the heartbreak that we all feel, just how inconceivable it is to us that the families of these men who worked hard all of their lives, for student education, who were all church members, who loved and served their country and wanted to make it better and safer, who were wonderful brothers and fathers and sons, have ended up in prison. And we don't want to believe in an America that the men like these were prosecuted and, and persecuted because they're black. No, they weren't shot by policemen, but for us, it's, it's, it's as if they had been killed. And they weren't even wearing hoodies. <laughs> they wore blue suits with white shirts and striped ties. But now they're just slaves again. Hi, I'm Ron Christopher Jones. And I have the honor of portraying David Banks in the race card face up. Hi, my name is Mark Christopher Lawrence. It's my pleasure to play the role of Gary Walker. Take hey, action. My name is Anthony Gordon Ham, and I have the privilege of portraying Clinton Stewart in Judge H. Lee Sarekin's reading, The Race Card Face Up. I urge you to take action now. My name is Walter Murray, and I'm playing Kendrick Barnes. Please. Hear our story. My name is Lawrence Brown, and I had the honor of playing Demetrius Harper. Take action. My name is Naomi Kamara, and I'm with Kaya Banks, and I'm asking you to take action.
Is the microphone on? Yes. Um, first, I want to say, if you've watched uh, any movies about the wrongful convictions, they always end up with a satisfactory conclusion. Uh, the person gets out. Uh, I've been saying to my friends here that I was a total failure. I accomplished nothing. I wrote articles, um, did the play, wrote the letter to President Obama, first time I had ever done that. Um, but despite that, I have to say this, I have received the most lovely letters from the individuals, from their family, from their children. I mean, you cannot believe um, uh, what, what it means to me. And they've given me gifts, which I find very embarrassing, but I, I thank them for it. Uh, what we're going to do now, unless I forgot something, yes, uh, the five will take their seats now. Uh, Graham is here. If you raise your hand, uh, you'll be able to ask any question. And I, I think you'll uh, experience things that I've never experienced before because you don't normally get much of a chance to speak to somebody who's actually been in prison. So I'll ask the five to sit and first identify themselves. And you can use that mic. On, but I'll tell you this, this is a immodest thing to say, that movie makes me cry. I, I wrote it and uh, seen it about 10 times, but it, with that I'm not late. Gentlemen, introduce yourselves. My name is David Banks. Is the mic working? Yes. Talk loud. It's got to be louder. My name is David Banks. Hello, my name is Demetrius Harper. I'm Clint Stewart. I'm Kendrick Barnes. Thank you, Robert. And my name is David Devolt. All right, questions from the audience? Raise your hand and Hi, uh, I heard a conviction date of 2012, and the video we just saw is also a few years old. Can you give us an update on your situations now? Are you all free and out of prison, or what's your status? Yes, we were all released from prison uh, in 2020. And uh, we got out a little bit early due to the pandemic. Um, only person that had predated the pandemic that was released was, was Ken Barnes. And his, he had the shortest, he had the seven year sentence. The rest of us were 10 and 11 years. Micah, can this be a little louder? Yes. Yeah. Am I right? I'm gonna hear, can you hear it in the back? I'll talk louder. Okay. I'll talk, we'll do our best to talk louder. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, does the Supreme Court give a reason uh, when they deny a case? And if so, uh, what was said? And the second thing I wondered, at any time was your project and its purpose ever a target in the proceedings and was the indictment? idea taken over by anyone else? Hey, Judge Sarakin, do you want to answer about the Supreme Court? Yes, the, no, the Supreme Court gives no reason uh, when it denies a petition. And with regards to uh, somebody else using the product, uh, it is our belief that the, the raid was about acquiring the product. Um, one thing that happened when they raided our business is that they said they were there to uh, obtain financial documents uh, for our business with staffing company. Well, they came in at the raid at 9 a.m. and they left at 10 p.m. that night. 
they had literally copied and imaged every single computer in the building. And to top it off, many financial records were actually left there at, uh, at our corporate office. So we have not seen any software out there. Typically the way the government works is they'll issue what they call an RFP, a request for a proposal or an RFI. So many of you might be familiar with that. And they'll collect information on your product and bids, and then they'll select based on the capabilities of your product and pricing. So we were a little more proactive in the fact that we developed a platform before ever receiving an RFP because we saw a need uh, after 9-11 that, that, that we thought was critical and we could use our talents to build something that would benefit law enforcement, uh, both the information sharing and collaboration. Thank you. Why did the Innocence uh, Project reject your appeal? Uh, typically, the Innocence Project uh, handles more DNA-related type matters. White-collar crimes, you just don't see anybody really involved in that. The DNA evidence is something that's uh, more tangible for them to actually get a hold of, where things that happen in white-collar cases are somewhat a little more, there's a lot more nuance and other type things that, uh, that has to be looked at. And evidence has to be looked at uh, more than motives because DNA by itself can actually exonerate a person who committed a rape or a murder uh, where there's just a lot more detail than a lot of white collar type cases. Uh, I have a, a double question. One is, did you ever go back to the project? And the other is, what are you gentlemen doing professionally now? <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll pass this down to each one. They can tell you what they're doing professionally. Um, the software is in good hands. There is some work being done on selective, mo selective modules right now. Uh, some uh, we anticipate being able to launch within the next six months to a year through a company that that hope that uh that actually owns the product right now and uh, i've been pretty much involved in some software work based on some apps uh this particular product plus some other uh software projects i'm working on uh while i do that and that's where i'm at right now is overseeing some projects Basically what happened is when you go to prison at 39 and you spend eight years in prison, then all of your goals get derailed. So I'm looking at, okay, what do we have to do to leave something to my daughter, to retire and all this other type of stuff? Well, if we go back to working just a normal job, something has to give. Some of us are still going back to work normal jobs, but we also have to find a way to retire and be able to provide and leave a legacy for our children. So those are some of the important things. Yeah, David, can I just uh, interrupt? Because we discussed this before. Uh, I, I'd like you to tell the audience or one of you about the difficulty in obtaining employment. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your, that question, um, I was, I've had two jobs. I'm an Oracle DBA in the IT field, and each time I'm able to gain employment, however, what happens is most uh, companies require a background check, and you have to uh, uh, choose or check that you have you been convicted as a felon. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to lie about that, but I do have documentation that states our innocence. Um, some of the letters provided by uh, Judge H. Lee Serkin, and we would provide that to the prospective employer. Um, months later, they come back and say, well, due to that fact, we will not be able to continue employment. Um, just to give you an example of that, I was let go last week on Thursday, and I worked there nine months. Outstanding um, uh, employee, but these are some of the type of things that once you are behind the 
the wall of justice and get convicted, it's very hard. The system is in place to uh, not allow you to provide for your family after that fact. All right, Graham, I'll give it back to you. Where are you? Anybody else hand up? Uh, yes, what was the uh, racial composition of your jury? It was, it was primarily, we had two African Americans, uh, the, uh, the rest mostly white, and I think two Hispanics, if, if memory serves. Somebody in the back? They haven't finished answering the question of what they were all doing now. They were going to be passing the microphone down yeah, and doing that. I was looking forward to hearing the rest of them speak. Oh, okay, we'll pass that on. Yeah, I, I've um, been doing a little bit of consulting right now on a development project for healthcare with uh, provider uh, directory. And I've done some work with uh, security, but uh, nothing on a permanent basis, but available for consulting. Um, I got first in 2018. It took me two years to gain employment to where I'm today. Um, the, the industry changed a lot to where every company does a background check. So I would interview, the company would love my credentials, love the interview, and people would send me an offer of, to for hire, but then that offer was contingent on the background check. And so most for two years, I was going through a process of almost, you almost want to give up because you're applying, yes, you feel great, background check. Applying, yes, you feel great, background check. So the last, the position I'm currently on, thanks to this play, and to articles that uh, Judge Serafina wrote, I sent that along uh, when they were going to do the background check. I just, uh, before they started, I told them, look, I'm a convicted felon. I want you to look at this material, uh, make the decision for yourself. Uh, I didn't do any crime, but I want you to make that decision. And based off that, I'm hired. I've been working just shy of two years coming in, in April. So I'll be doing a... Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, doing basically software architecture for uh, a major systems intermediate. And for me, one of the positions that I applied for, they actually offered me the position, they were very excited, and then they did a search on the internet and found out about the conviction. They hadn't even done a background check yet. And they withdrew the offer. And I said, well, do you want to understand what happened? No, we don't. Luckily, a few months later, I had another interview. I was hired, and I had worked for them for a couple of months, and they did a background check, but their background check doesn't go deep into criminal history, so the background check came back clean, and I've been working there for 18 months. I am just so grateful that that happened. Uh, what, what I trying to understand is, did the staffing companies initiate the, this action? Uh, no, not generally. Uh, we would contact the staffing company, tell them we needed resources to work on projects related to the NYPD and the Department of Homeland Security who were asking us for modifications. They want, pretty much wanted to see what the software would do. So when we contact the staffing company, they would send us their staffing agreement and their terms, and we would sign the agreement. And that's how almost every single transaction took place. We didn't, the government never presented any evidence that we falsified any sort of credit application or anything along those lines. And during trial, when uh, they admitted that they relied on our Dun & Bradstreet that we were we were high risk, yeah, but uh, one guy said we invest in these or take chances on these type of companies because they might miss out on the next Microsoft. So that's the type of thing. Businesses risk staffing companies typically, if I could, have a portfolio. They'll have their low risk, large companies that they staff for, the mid-sized companies, 
and then they have the higher risk companies that they they invest in, and many times if if that goes uh, if that if that project fails, they can usually write those off, but they still are able to make their profits based on their low risk their low risk business, and that's typically the way the model works. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, yeah, what I'm what I'm trying to figure out is if it's against the staffing company's interest for you to go to jail because that killed any possibility of you retaining them. Right. Yeah, and some staffing companies actually complain about that. <laughs> and the rent code is not one staffing agency initiated any contact with the FBI or the government to complain that we were trying to rip them off. Not one. Basically, the case started with the former U.S. attorney. Uh, he was a former U.S. attorney, and that was during the film. If you saw, he, he started. He sent a letter to the current uh, attorney's office, but he never said who he was representing. And even in the uh, discovery, like when you start going to trial, you get discovery from uh, what the staffing company, company actually said. And there were several companies that were like, "Please don't take this criminal, or we won't get paid." So you take this criminal. Exactly. If you go to prison. We can't continue to sell the software and work. So we really don't know who initiated or who kicked off the uh, criminal investigation. Does that satisfactory for you, sir? Well, none of this is satisfactory, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Um, I, I, um, Sorry, I, I'm used to holding it, and I guess it's being held away from me. Um, um, I I didn't understand. Did did the first judge who lost uh, lost the critical staff for that would have uh, that would have um, released you? Did how many how many times did you have to appeal, and were you all? released together uh, in, in a decision, and when? And uh, also, has it affected at all your um, ability to vote? Your, have they tried to suppress your voting rights? Well, we'll start, and voting rights are typically done at the state level. So Colorado, where we live, will allow you to actually vote. So that's not necessarily an issue. So other states, I think, Yes, other states have laws that prohibit felons from voting, then there are, there are issues in some other states. Um, now, can you, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the first half of your question. Um, was it the same judge that, um, that couldn't find her statement and so on, or had you gone through several judges before you were finally um, or declared innocent or, or let go or whatever? Well, we were never declared innocent. We served our sentence until uh, the pandemic released some people early from prison based on certain criteria. But at that point, we were like a year to two years left uh, before we got out because on an 11 year sentence, I would serve nine and a half and in the federal system, you have to serve 85% of your sentence. And the other guys would serve close to eight and a half, and I would serve an extra year, uh, given that uh, I had a one year longer extended sentence. The judge never, as, as the play discussed, the judge never did anything, or the courts never did anything to cure what happened on the transcript. And one of the key things is we were at a sidebar. Everybody's familiar with a sidebar. Everybody goes up to the court. Well, the government was two government attorneys, prosecutors were at the sidebar. While all of this stuff was being discussed, they never said a word about what they heard. And Judge Sarek in, in the play mentioned that. Well, if you know this happened, why aren't you saying anything? Because I, we believe they don't want to say anything just in case the transcript, if they say we actually did what the judge said and the transcript opposes that, then they'll have to, they could be disbarred for lying and all this other type of stuff. So they chose to stay silent instead of saying this is what happened at the sidebar. Thank you. I have a 
question to Judge Sorokin. Uh, first of all, I just want to say it's a heartbreaking story, and I feel for you. Your life, your life has changed forever. You know, uh, Judge Sorokin. You know, apparently, you tried very hard to uh, help them. You even wrote something to President Obama. How come you didn't succeed? <laughs> well, I've been asking myself the same question. Uh, as, as I said before, uh, I, I started very slow because if you're a retired judge, uh, it's not good form to criticize some uh, colleagues. So I wanted to be very careful at the beginning. But the more I got into it, the more I read about it, the more exercised I got. And I did write, I think, four or five for the Huffington Post, uh, and then the play. And we were hoping, and that's why I say I feel like a failure, and that's a good question. Uh, I was hoping that as a result of the video, we would get 100,000 signatures and we could present that to, to President Obama. But I think we got about three or 4,000 uh, tops. It's on YouTube, by the way. Uh, but, and, and by the way, can I have a show of hands? Did any of you see the play before? A couple, okay. I was so worried that you, but I've watched it a couple of times. I, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, it, it's a very sad story, and uh, as you can see, these are five remarkable people, intelligent, educated, and all of that got my motor going. But um, as I say, in usually exoneration movies, the person is always acquitted, uh, but unfortunately it didn't happen here. Was the ACLU able to help at all? No, we, uh, through a just cause, the organization that was mentioned, advocacy organization, they went to, they went everywhere, including the ACLU. Uh, people are just not really interested in that. It, it, it gives the impression that uh, everybody seems to side with the government, or they fear the government that if they were actually to speak out on it, that the government might come after them. We have issues where two reporters started to, uh, to actually go after this story. And they were pretty much told, if I were you, I would not touch this story. And two were fired for trying to pursue this story. And ironically, because you ask about uh, others and other involvements, there were probably 70 plus trips to Washington, D.C. to meet with congressmen. Uh, in essence, at the very beginning, when we were representing ourselves, this was an unusual situation. Uh, six defendants fire their attorneys on the same day in the same room and say, we're going pro se. Well, the media never reported. And then at the very beginning, we were asking the media, look, please, come ask us any question. We'll provide you with information. All at one time, the media got shut down. They were calling, then in Denver, um, it's like somebody just turned turned it off. Click. Nobody would contact us anymore. And we literally took a day trip to New York and hand delivered to NBC, CBS, and ABC our story. I mean, hand delivered to them, and it just everything would they would be interested. They would be concerned, like you are now, when they hear the story. But then we would they would just go dark on us after that. It, is the issue of pardon uh, off the table now? Well, pardon is never off the table, but you get the sense that uh, even with President Obama, uh, which we had some faith in, but you start to look at politicians in a little different light. <laughs> um, if it's not politically advantageous, then politicians typically won't really stay involved. Now, if they're going to get some political capital from it, then they'll, they'll stay engaged and say, okay, we can get a photo out, 
we can get on TV, we can talk about, shake our hands about the injustice and all this other type of stuff, and they can look good on television. Honestly, that's the way we feel. Um, so if we were basically discouraged from going to see another presidential pardon, we've been through Obama, we went to Trump, uh, so I'm not a uh, I'm really not a Trump fan. I'm not a I'm not a politician fan to begin with. Uh, not policies. The guy's just crazy to me. So, um, but overall, we we're just oh, uh, what's the use of going to another president? It's not politically advantageous unless you're tied into somebody that's tightly tied into him and network closely to him. You virtually have no chance. And that's our view on, the, on that issue. And may I just intercede for a moment uh, in respect to one of the questions. It's true, uh, as David says, the ACLU is not interested in white collar cases where people are being sued basically uh, or indicted uh, for not paying their bills. Uh, that isn't what they do. So it would not be unusual that they would refuse it. And uh, it's true, those cases, the, the ACLU wants to take on the cases that are civil rights cases. Um, this was just a miscarriage of justice, but I, I think nothing that they would be interested in. And to uh, Judge Sarakin, we'd like to say how honored we are to be here, to meet you in person, and to meet the man, the only man, <laughs> that would hear our case and speak for us and write a, uh, a letter to the president, that's huge in our eyes. And so we went far and wide, like Ken has said, for years. For years after the indictment, we had a proffer this thick in a six inch binder that we gave to the, to the uh, federal attorneys to show this is not guilt, this is innocent. We took it to the news media and you were the only one that heard us and that received our story and investigated and wrote about us and advocated for it. Everybody else ghosted us out. Everybody else shut us down. And so we're so honored that you say you're a failure. You're not a failure. In our eyes, you're a champion right. of the justice that we were expecting. The problem is so huge that one man tried to make a difference, but you're definitely not a failure. We appreciate what you've done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Now you see why I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> yes, we are lovely. Um, if it's not too personal, could you say a little bit about your families? Because while you're in prison, as somebody mentioned, your your family was in prison too, and I'd like to know how, just a little bit about how they survived. Well, one thing that happened with our families, obviously, this is. Uh, uh, a very difficult situation for mother. My mother will say that on the day we were convicted, she just went over on the side of her bed and just cried and cried and cried and cried. And the tears flow for quite some time. Uh, my daughter was one, she said, because I have a man cave in the basement. <laughs> So she would go down after I was taken away, sit where I sat on the couch, and she would just cry and cry and cry. So the impact of what happens in a family from my sisters uh, to my brother, it is just, it's indescribable, the shock and the sadness that happens when somebody's actually taken away. Uh, one good thing is, uh, we had got great support not only from family but for the from the church to help maintain because this is a destructive process when the breadwinners are taken out of the family literally a person could be on the street this is this is devastation at a level that you really couldn't believe if not then for the church uh, and like I said my mother's the pastor and everybody come together to make sure they supported the families that sort of support uh, was immeasurable. Uh, and then they can talk about, others who have kids, what actually happened. And I will have Tiffany speak on Clinton's daughter, on how she felt 
I'm sorry, I'll have Tiffany speak, Clinton, Clinton Stewart's daughter who's here, to speak directly on how she felt uh, when her father was taken away to prison. Let's do it now, then, baby. Nice to have some youth here. <laughs> um, well, my name is Tiffany. I'm Clinton's daughter. Um, I certainly didn't expect to speak, but um, I'm, you know, just grateful for the opportunity. Um, what it did um, to me, my dad was taken three days before my 18th birthday. Um, it was just me and him. You know, um, he's divorced. I chose to live with him. So having um, your only parent snatched out of your life um, three days before you, we can be turned an adult is definitely, um, it was the hardest thing that I ever went through. Um, when he left, um, I was just at, at home by myself, just looking at all four walls, not sure what to do with myself. Like um, David mentioned, of course, you have the support of the, of the church and the pastor, but there's nothing like having the support in your own home. So um, for me, it's like, I don't know where to go, you know, um, I don't, I didn't know where, where to turn and it's just, you know, going through the process over the years and it's like you're fighting so hard to, um, you know, hope somebody would listen to you, hope, so, hope that somebody would believe, like my father's not a criminal, um, he raised me right, he raised me to, you know, to, to pretty much trust in the justice system if you don't do anything wrong, it's like you have nothing to worry about, but that's not true when you're black. It's not true that that you won't that um, you will get justice. It's not the color of your skin um, of our skin determines that we are liars, right? In the in the eyes of, of the justice system, and it's just it's hard to live through that, and it's hard to visit your visit your loved one in prison. Um, of course, you're having a good time while you're there, but then all of a sudden, when the visitation is over, you see them lined up against the back wall, and they're being packed down by by officers and it's just you see them hauled away all over again and it just it's a constant reminder that it's like they don't care about you they don't care that the fact that your your father is innocent they don't care about any of that stuff and so as a as a child I'm 28 years old now and it's still watching that play back it just brought me to tears because how many people don't even have the privilege to have somebody speak up for them you know, to have somebody believe in you. And I, I just, Eric, and it's such an honor to, to meet you because you gave me hope. You know, I can't imagine how they felt, but as the, as the child, um, I'm truly grateful that somebody was like, hey, I, I believe you. You know, it's the hardest thing in the world for somebody, you know, you're telling the truth and nobody believes you. So I appreciate it. Thank you. For me, it was very difficult because I remember the day the conviction came down, I called my dad and he wanted nothing to do with me. My whole family just totally abandoned him. But I'm so grateful for the friends that I had at the church and David's mom, the pastor, took me in as her family. And for eight years while we were in prison, I had visits every weekend from friends from the church. I mean, it was unheard of. I, I had CEOs talk to me. How is it that the only people that visit you are black? You know, it was, it was unbelievable to see a family that I was, I mean, I, I called my dad and after my mom passed away, I talked to him week after week after week because he was back in Massachusetts and I was in Colorado. And I say, so how are my sisters doing? I don't know, I haven't talked to them in weeks. But when I told him what happened, oh, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And it was, it was heartbreaking to see that happen. And my mom had passed away 17 years ago this week. And I was glad that she was not around to see this because it would have broken her heart. Why do you think that you were rejected everywhere you went until Judge Sarakin came along? 
I actually think the big business, big government and big business uh, was involved in this to take us down. Uh, the software had got really high praise from a lot of high level officials in law enforcement. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security representative said at trial that this software, they would, uh, of this magnitude, they would pay a billion dollars for. So we assume when you're dealing in those type of potential revenues or money coming in, uh, yes, the sharks are everywhere. They're not going to let you, if they can avoid it, get that money. Um, and I think that's probably, in our view, what happened. And I think a lot of people, in essence, are scared to really speak because the government, uh, there are stories with, I'm sorry, with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we heard not only some of these in prison, but we've seen it outside of prison where uh, guys might be a drug dealer or something, and the, they were, they bought their grandmother a car, and the government will come and say, well, if you don't take this plea deal, we'll uh, indict your grandmother. So things like this actually happen. I don't think people recognize just how insidious some of these prosecutions may be, because the government, in many cases, in our view, and I'm not anti-government, but I am anti-injustice, and people should be concerned about it, but too, too often than not, the government's not really concerned about it, and people are too scared in this society because the government has gotten so powerful to really speak out or for, for them and their family that something might uh, befall them. And then I, I'd like to add something to that. Uh, and it's one of the things that I've written about and that is the refusal of U.S. attorneys or any prosecutors in a case, for instance, where it's an old case and DNA will determine whether the person who had been convicted uh, is guilty or not. And they resist the DNA. And what lies beneath all that, and I, I don't say it's true of all prosecutors, is they don't want to look bad. They don't want to try a case and get a conviction and then be told that it was wrong. So there is that it built in resistance uh, for them to participate in overturning cases. And another angle to that question is around the same time, the FBI was working on their own software for investigations called virtual case law. And their goal was to have a system to where the FBI would have, would have controlled the system for the government for how to do investigations. Our software, inadvertently, we didn't know that they were in, the bar in parallel. And we were working with the Department of Homeland Security. So if you remember around that time, when uh, Department of Homeland Security came into being, they were kind of in competition with the FBI of who's going to be the terrorist chaser of the time. So. In my opinion, also, you couldn't have this upstart agency coming in with a software program that was less expensive and, in my mind, superior. And that, the FBI's virtual case file, and this is all, I mean, you can check this on Wikipedia, Google, it failed. And they, that was $300 million of, that Congress gave them, and the program never succeeded. But there were a lot of government contractor companies helping them that made out like a bandit on that failed program. And they actually got more money to do part two, which was Sentinel, which was supposedly completed, but you don't see anyone use it. So to David's point, there were a lot of big businesses that were trying to make money because it was an, an initiative at that time after 11 for information sharing. And we didn't know that, you know, just with our idea, we were swimming with sharks at the time. The last uh, element to that is we don't want to forget we did receive from Homeland Security a uh, request to submit a uh, sole source justification. Okay, so here's a billion dollar project, money's been set aside, and they researched for two years for this technology. They did not find it. We demonstrated it. 
went through the RFP process, no one else had the technology. So the project manager said, we want you to sign a sole source justification. Just write it up, I will sign it. There is no competition for this contract. You're the sole source. The billion dollars will go to you. So they, in that situation, swimming with sharks, and you're the only one with the solution on a sole source federal contract, we didn't know it, but we were in a very dangerous situation. It's a hand of, oh, oh you got somebody? Well, first, your judgment of the judge is quite correct. We too love the dorm and respect them. So thank you for that. Uh, secondly, having worked for a big company, I can assure you that your suspicions may be correct. Thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> and may I add something that I totally forgot before? Uh, I told you about the lovely letters that I've gotten and gifts and everything, but this is the first time that we have met in person. They all said they were going to come down and uh, I wanted to want to say thank me, meet me, and uh, what a thrill it is to meet them in person although we've communicated and as you know I've tried to help them but uh, it's the most remarkable group of people if these are criminals uh, then I don't know my business <laughs> I have another question um, and uh, first of all uh, I'm, I'm I think this is playing the right, I might, this might be called playing the race card, but um, is, was the first, that first judge white? No, the judge. Oh, I, I'm sorry, well, was the first judge white? And do you think that you would have stayed in prison as long as if you had, if you had been white? Uh, is it, was this a race issue also? Well, no, the judge, her uh, name's Christine Arguello, she was Hispanic. Uh, and the fact that this, there is a huge disparity in a lot of sentences uh, between African Americans and uh, Caucasian people. That's a documented fact, the statistics show it. Um, you can actually go down and find cases where, there was a single case where a judge had two defendants, one was black and one was white. They did the exact same thing. The white man got a slap on the wrist and the other guy went to prison for a very long time. So those type of things you see, um, they happen, but that's not with every judge. We, as African Americans, uh, we try to, Okay, we know injustice happens, but I can't say because this person has white skin or the judge is white. Judge Sarakin's a uh, Caucasian man. You can't say that each and every person is automatically going to give you a harsh sentence as a result of that. Uh, but Martin Luther King said, judge each man by the content and woman of the content of their character. Uh, so we, you try to hold on to that. Uh, and, and in this era now where where people try to say well we talk about white privilege i can't look at a man that i don't know and say he's racist that's absolute nonsense i don't know that person's background i don't know their character but too much in the media today seems to promote that sort of thing which is actually problematic so in essence i don't think uh a black judge, because we see systemic issues in the system. We saw it from black judges, we've seen it from white judges. So it it's really can't say that. I think this thing with not only the color race was involved, but also the color green was involved <laughs> when it came to money. So the combination of those two things uh, is pretty toxic. And when it really comes to race, that was one thing that I noticed, that from the raid, I was treated differently. I, all the guys were rounded up, they were followed by FBI agents. They let me wander around by myself. 
They let me walk out of the building without searching me while they were searching everybody. They were going through people's wallets and they just let me walk out. During the trial, during sentencing, the judge actually said to me, you were doing fine until you got involved with those guys. So you know that there was a race involved with the judge uh, just from a statement like that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, that your software is in good hands that you trust. My question is, how did something that got stolen from you get into somebody's hands that you trust? And and then the second question is, what can we do? Well, the software. This is the ironic thing. The government came in and shockingly, they obviously we were surprised when they showed up at 9 a.m. on February 9th, uh, 2005. But the complete version of the software, the original version that was what they call client server, had already been developed. It was not on site. We were developing additional functionality based on, everybody uses a browser, uh, based on uh, using the software directly through a browser-based system. So the government weren't, whoever came in wasn't able to escape with the completed version of the software that was written, uh, I don't want to get too technical, was written in a what they call client-server Windows-based platform that was not necessarily deployed on a browser, which is a term they call web-enabled. So that's uh, pretty much what happened where we were able to keep control of that code and they did get uh, intellectual property as it relates to the form feature and functionality of the new screens and stuff along those lines with some limited back-end functionality they got got that but they were not able to acquire the entire original version that the government first viewed uh, the modifications were made because the government switched positions Originally, they were scared of browser-based technologies because they said it was a security risk. And then midstream, while we're in the process of selling uh, or attempting to sell our software, they said, well, now the industry has changed, the government's position has changed. We want a more browser-based, web-enabled solution. And that's what prompted us to actually hire staffing resources to be able to kind of start moving this stuff and given something to the government that, okay, this works this way, this works that way. And as a small business, we have to be a little more accommodating. We don't have the benefit of a name of an IBM or some Accenture or some large company that says, we're IBM, we're Accenture. We don't have to prove anything. But as a small company, you have to prove to, the, to somebody like the Department of Homeland Security, and NYPD that your software is what it says it is. So we made modifications and extended ourselves on debt to accommodate their request or there never would have been any interaction with staffing companies per se. May, may I add something to that? Uh, I thought you'd be interested in knowing what got my attention. I mean, after I got the call and I began looking it up on the internet, there were two things that really stood out to me. One was the failure of the first grand jury to indict. I can tell you as a matter of experience that that is virtually unheard of. The old joke about a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. When a grand jury refuses, the prosecutor presents their case and the jury says, no way, that's a civil matter. That's what obviously what their conclusion was. And the other thing that motivated me, at least got my mojo going, uh, was the sentence that, sentences that were imposed. I mean, 11 years, even assuming that they were guilty of what, with which they were charged, 
11 years, when you read in the paper, the sentences are being handed out now. And that totally shocked me. Uh, anyway, forgive me for interrupting, but anybody else? All right, well, I, I will even stand for this. Look, I thank you all for coming. I hope you found that enlightening.